All right, well, welcome to DVU's Communication Access Connect. We meet once a month, you all know, because you're here. Um, but this is our first session of 2024, and I am Darlene Hansen. I chair this meeting <laughs> with Tim and, and uh, Tim and William, who you'll meet up here, and then Nina. This is our, our crew. And uh, I don't know how many, this is our third year maybe that we're doing this. I'm not sure. I think it is the third year. So that's exciting. We have fun ideas um, our way. But uh, I'm going to let us get started with Tim introducing. Oh, I'll tell you before we get started. One thing that's going to happen that's a little bit different than usual is um, we have one less speaker. Emma, I'm just getting word that Emma is, has had some health issues and she's not, she's okay, but she's not able to make it. And um, our we have two other speakers that are going to join us at 4.30. They had a class until 4.30 and then they're 30 and then they're going to, so until then it's going to be kind of disjointed, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. so today we're talking about your social batteries and Tim, you're going to start us off. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year, and it's nice to see you all again. I hope everyone had a good holiday and look forward to another great new season on Communication Access Connect. My name is Tim, and I'm the director of the Empowerment Team, and more specifically, I use an AAC device on the bottom of my wheelchair with my toes. I also have cerebral palsy and have many communication partners that echo my speech for me. You can't tell right now through my speech output, but I'm getting over a cold and I am very congested. <laughs> when I tried searching for a different voice on my device, there were no voices that sounded like they were speaking underwater because my ears are plugged and you all sound like we are in a submarine right now. <laughs> Has anyone seen the movie Hunch for Red October? <laughs> Today, we are going to discuss what's your social battery. Before we start the presentation, I would like to give you a definition of social battery. The ability to be self-aware of the energy used to remain and sustain self-awareness during a social interactions and to feel comfortable using self-advocacy to express one's needs based on the social interaction. Here is an example of my social battery. As much as I like seeing my friends and family over the holidays, I get drained from being around with people so much and always interacting with them, where I need to take care of myself by taking a break and stepping away to regroup and recharge again to join in the conversation. My friends and family understand that I'm not ignoring them but more like letting them know that I need my food to digest to devour the next meal. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I have a really fast metabolism, but we all have different levels of social battery. I'm going to have William take it from here and he can tell us more. All right. So we're gonna bump, we're gonna jump into, into presentation here. But before we do that, William, I wanted people to put either in the chat or you can just kind of nod your head, nod your head, however you want to do. I'm gonna put my view on, on gallery so I can see you all. Um, but anybody, anybody else thoughts? I mean, issues or can have to think about their social battery in their day or week. That's, uh, I, uh, that would be me. I do. Anybody else think about these things? Or raise your hand, your virtual hand, or whatever. But 
Yeah, I think it's a um, it's a thing we all deal with, and I don't know if if we all pay attention to it. And and I think and I think sometimes those of us who don't live with some kind of difference that needs an accommodation um, don't consider it. We just say, oh, you just have to power through it. <laughs> you know, and I think for many people, especially people who use accommodations of any kind, that's easier said than done. Now, with that said, I don't think it's healthy for any of us to power through it. <laughs> but I think that a lot of times society expects us to just power through it, right? And so really that's what we wanted today's conversation to be about supporting each other, maybe coming up with some great ideas. Um, yeah, Lena is saying um, power through it and then suffer autistic burnout. Exactly. So, you know, share ideas and um, situations. And if you have any stories as we're going along, you can jump right in because I, we don't think this is talk, this is talked about much. All right. I love this. Keep, keep those examples coming in. But we're going to start off with you, William, because you, you are going to this conversation, right? And so for you, William, what does socializing mean to you? Like what's, what's perfect social situation? For me, socializing is the opportunity to live my life out loud with family, friends, or community. Sometimes I want to type a lot. Other times, I prefer to just listen. When I was younger, some of my teachers tried to teach me social skills. The thing is, there was a focus on making eye contact or listening with my whole body to look social. That was funny to me and did not work very well. Then one day I met my two best friends, Bella and Otto. We had a very nice teacher, but decided instead of a class, we wanted real, lived experiences. We all type to communicate, which is part of being social, but so is going to new places or trying new things. We started small with just going out for hamburgers and french fries. Little by little, we have tried more things like traveling or advocacy work together. We have met more friends along the way and meet up with them on Zoom or in person often. My perfect social experience? I would say it is one that I choose and one where I have the support I need to greet the experience without having to worry. That's that, that, that's great. That's great stuff. Um, I, I'm thinking too about like when you said people writing goals for social experience, social goals, right? And yet, and the, you mentioned eye contact. That was like it's an automatic, right? Eye contact, eye contact. That's an automatic. Um, <laughs> what? Um, maybe some of some of you also have some things in here that. Where do where do professionals, I guess we'll just say professionals, miss the mark on social skills, goals? Any idea any idea? You guys, Alvar says, uh, I definitely have to think about it. My energy levels are much lower than I would like, which leads me to try to push through to get done what I need to and still be able to socialize occasionally. And Susan says, yes, if I overdo, so overdo social tests, I will have trouble sleeping and then get run down. Good observation. Good observation. Any other ridiculous well, profession? I have a hard time making eye contact with anyone. Even now, when I meet new people, I don't make eye contact with anyone because it's hard for me. Yeah, no, no, no one. It's called staring. If you made eye contact, there's the word for it. It's staring. <laughs> but um, we don't think that way, do we? William says yes. Like you have to see to communicate. Right. That's kind of that's kind of what they're right. <laughs> now I get what people are where it came from, 
because it gives a perception to people on the outside that that's how we look at is this person paying attention to me right but it's not like what's not what's not possible a person is paying attention if they're not making eye contact it is <laughs> it is possible to do that um but we act like it's the only way people are going to know you're paying attention you know um i don't know if bella's on here but i know bella like you kind of touch and touch a touch at people and to me that way that's how i know you're paying attention to me is when you tap on me right um so I think everybody's different, um, but we tend to think it's a big deal. Anybody else got, I was looking to see if there's anything else. Okay, feel free to write in the chat your ideas because we're hoping we get excited about this topic. Um, okay, William, I got another one for you. Is it possible to have too much socializing? Is that possible? I think so. We sometimes forget that people with disabilities may want more or less of something, including being social. The systems try to help us in offering us activities is awesome, except when it isn't. <laughs> when I was in school, we had a weekly community outing. It was usually going out to lunch for fast food. There are not many places I can eat with my food allergies, and I really prefer bringing my own lunch. Most of the time I stayed behind with my staff. That would be an example of too little. In my life today, I have my parents supporting me and lots of activities to choose from. Deciding when to slow down can be hard, and I am learning to read my body more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you brought up, oh, here, here's, I'm going to, we're going to go to that, but don't let me forget. I love that you brought up the whole eating, social eating thing. Um, but before we do that, Christine says, my teen says, my said he has to keep all his behaviors under control and pay attention in order to be social. He has managed to do it for about 15 minutes max, but then ends up in bed after that. What ideas could you give for him so that he can be himself and maybe last a little longer in social situations? And Sheila says, um, when, they, uh, when you do the whole eye contact thing and you're staring, then they're like, well, now you have to stop staring, right? They, they want to know why are you staring? That, that's right. That's right. Never happy. Um, but you brought up William the the whole eating eating thing. As a as a society, I think we do look at food as a place and a way that we gather to to chat and to socialize, right? But how is that different for all of you? Kenley says my sister cooks while cooks while we chat. When I go to her house, she gives me eye contact occasionally, but. It knows she's, but I, I, but I know she's listening because she responds immediately. Yeah, we chit chat while cooking. True. Alvar says I can says I can relate him. I don't do eye contact, and my body language and facial expressions apparently don't match what I am feeling, or I'm listening even when I am. My favorite people to socialize with are those who don't expect me to act like a neurotypical person and are happy to just hang out without needing to communicate or inter or directly interact when the, when that I can manage it popped up hang on uh, for the day or who are willing to wait for me to communicate when I'd like to those are good those are really great points Alvar um, um, that's a whole nother thing we can talk about right Having your facial expressions and your body language match your intent. Like how many, if you agree with, if that happens to you, you might put a little thumbs up on Alvar's or put it in the chat too. I think that's a biggie that comes up often, right? People think you're saying being away a certain way. Like I was on mute when I first got on for about three minutes and 
had a serious face because I couldn't figure out why no one was talking to me, but it was because I was on mute. And then Tim thought, couldn't figure out why I was grouchy, <laughs> but I wasn't being grouchy. I was just going, how come no one's talking to me? Uh, um, we had a communication breakdown and my body language didn't match with my intent. Nestor says, I'm, I'm here to listen, see what everyone has to say. Being social does not come naturally to me and takes a lot of effort. Are there, are there strategies to reduce the mental effort? You have to process people's facial expressions and tones of voice. And I have to figure out what the room is and what are the, what their appropriate response is. I'm looking for social skills classes because, because it will help. Okay. Well, our next speakers, the, the, we'll make sure, Nestor, you don't have to write, you don't have to write it. Again. Um, we'll make sure that we give this one to Sonia and Robin, because that's what they work on. Elena says, yeah, it helps to be around other neurodivergents, so you don't have to worry about masking. That is so draining. Would you say that what Nestor is talking about is masking? Yes. Okay. So um, I think for, um, I think for you about that. William says yes, Alvar. I was just with family for a wedding and had so much fun listening and watching others in the room. And Tina says I look forward to my days with my neurodivergent caregivers because because hang on because I feel less stress and I am not uh oh where'd it go okay and I am myself on these days. It takes a lot of energy, huh? Um, I think in terms of the whole um, going, I'm, I'm not persevering on food. I'm just going back to my topic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of that, I know as a professional, um, a lot of times either professional, other professionals or parents would want us to work on social skills at lunchtime for students, for example, or even for adults, for adults. But if you're working on your food and you have like a different diet or you have some, some you know, issues that make it so you eat differently than rest or to have that happening at the same time that you're supposed to be socializing, socializing is, is like whew, way too much. I think for people, that was my impression anyways. And, um, so the teens, you know, if you want the person to be socializing during the meal, then you should have them eat at a different time because they can't do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. often, right? mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I write in doing that, but that's, that was always my input to the situation because I felt like people were being bombarded with way too many um, goals in a sense, right? Things they need to do differently at the same time. And, and I'm never, and I'm never. Um, yeah, Albert says, I find eating out stressful as well, both due to allergies and other food limitations. And because I've gotten feedback about my eating, not holding civil work correctly or eating properly, which is due to the disability. Oh, people nagging you guys. Yes, this is good. <laughs> Go for it, Tim. I don't talk or type when I'm eating. My parents never made me and my brothers to have a real conversation when we are eating together at the table. I might have one word answer when I'm eating, but not have a multiple level conversation to answer back to them when I'm eating. Yeah. This is kind of difficult for me when I'm dating someone because I have to let them know that I don't like to socialize when we are going to dinners. They can't figure that out, Tim. I think you need to find somebody else to do. <laughs> I mean, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that's a brainer man okay albert says um he says yeah darlene eating can be trouble enough it makes trying 
to socialize is so much harder and I can't type to communicate while eating either. Right, exactly. And speaking people aren't supposed to be talking with their mouth full anyways. Um, so mm-hmm. no matter which box we're checking, we're not actually supposed to be talking while we're eating, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Kathleen says, if I'm not a good meal partner. I have difficulty swallowing, so I can't talk when eating. And Sheila says, yes, people ask tons of questions while eating mm-hmm. and say, so I can't talk when eating, right? Yes, people um, say, so don't talk with your mouth full. Exactly. Exactly. And why aren't you answering me? And exactly. Okay, put in the chat. I'm off script, you guys, but this is a good conversation. Put in the chat, where do you like to socialize? Because think of eating as a as a meals as a place to socialize. So if that's not, if that's out, what's the context that you like to socialize in? Philip says, keeping my self-regulated and related and social norms is always a challenge, but every encounter is a win for me. Practice makes perfect. My outside body doesn't reflect my inner wants and needs for the social interactions. Exactly. Okay, Tina says, she likes one-on-one, uncomfortable ground, familiar, quiet places. Cool. Okay. I don't know if I told you guys the story of, uh, we would have a Christmas party at my house every year and um, some of the families that I work with would come that lived in the town, in my town, right? And um, some people were the same, the same age as my kids. And so they, a couple of years, they would go caroling. That was the thing that the teenagers would do. They would go caroling. And so my friend went with them, my kids, to go caroling. <laughs> So I asked my kids, how did he do, you know? And they're like, well, okay, but he didn't really stay with us. <laughs> but he has autism and he, he never stayed with people. He always like was, was, you know, four feet away from you. And so I'm like, oh, no, that's okay. That's him being with you. <laughs> so they're going, okay, just as long as that, as long as that was, but that was him being with them, Caroline, right? Um Okay, Kathleen says for me, any any time I'm eating. <laughs> so we totally missed the mark on that goal for you, Kathleen. Mm-hmm. Carrie says, Carrie says, after, duh, exactly. Mm-hmm. Elena says, the only non-Zoom social interactions I do when I'm when I'm alone is in their car or at their house. Okay. William says we are taught I want a cookie for communication. That should stop. That should stop. <laughs> Especially since you don't want one, huh, William? <laughs> um, Sheila, Sheila says, always told I'm inappropriate talk or mannerism functions. We're going to talk about that some more too. Davis says, I like environments I can control. Sound like furniture is important to me. Sheila says, even just sitting there, being there. Marielle says, church and fellowship, friend house. My different hobby places I like to socialize. And Tina agrees with David. Joy says, my son tells my grandma, grandma, I'm eating. You'll need to wait till I'm done eating. Then we can talk. Perfect. Great. I love that you guys are advocating too. That's so awesome. All right. I'll get back on script, William. So let's talk a bit about your friends and your social battery. What do your friend activities look like so that you don't wear yourself out? socially like if i was going with you to socialize what would i see you doing to get together getting together with friends can be fun and make me tired all at the same time (laughs) it's a good idea to read each other's energy and let them know that it is okay to just listen or take a break (laughs) have to say that sometimes Emma and I just <laughs> sit while others talk. We went camping with friends a few years ago and I learned <laughs> Emma likes yoga too when she joined me for some relaxation poses. <laughs> Once in a while I need to cancel or change plans because my battery is low. It is hard, but my friends are great and I know the next time I see them will be yeah. too. 
So I think that's probably why a lot of you are saying you, you like to hang out with neurodivergent people because if you have to have a cancellation or a, or a I'm just going to be here right now experience, no one even takes it personally, right? It's just what happens. Um, does anybody, feel, I think what you're getting at, William, William, a little is sometimes your socializing is not like talking and communicating or typing and communicating, right? Some, sometimes it's not that experience. Anybody else have anything along that line? Like I am socializing, I'm just not talking to you. Alvar says, if I want to communicate somewhere comfortable and good sensory wise, like my, okay. If I can socialize without communicating too much, I like to go places, oh, Alvar read my mind. Um, go places like an art gallery or museum or something. Tina says not to expect eye contact. Carrie says I says I just listen, which gets bored. You get bored doing that. Tina says I'm sad because I want to stay. I have obligations today. I have to leave soon. Oh, okay. Bye, Tina. See you next time. I think William's type and Tim are typing something. While William and Tim are typing, I just want to say that line, I think, William, when you were saying things can be fun and tiring at the same time, is that ever true? I, I see that in my son and his, you know, his peers, um, that, that you, you just like how to navigate that is, is always, is always a thing, but it is, I love hearing it described like that because I think that goes on so much. You know, it, it, it something can be actually ener both energizing and draining at the same time. And, um, you know, just sort of figuring out the strategies in the moment based on the, you know, where you're at. My son loves to, he loves to go to the actual movies. I'm so thrilled about that. But he also loves to talk through the movie a lot. So that, you know, so we we're constantly going back and forth about that. But anyway, I love that fun and tiring at the same time. Interesting. I wonder if he likes to do that. You'd have to ask him, Nina, but anybody else have that experience where they like to go to the movies and talk through it? I'm wondering if it's easier to talk with a movie than to talk like one-on-one, -on -one, you know? Right in the dark, there's something about the environment well, it, that- it's, it, you know. You're watching it without the energy, you know? Yeah, William, go for it. Yes, we listen to music, go to museums, take walks or dance. Other times we just sit. That is O. K. Two. So <laughs> I'm just I'm just thinking about all the educational social goals that have been written and written. <laughs> That would not have let you meet the goal, right? So we missed it. We totally missed I mean, golly. If I could apologize for everybody, I would, but I can't because I know there's people that think I'm wrong. So I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize. But I apologize for me if I said something like that. Um, Philip says, I like to go with my friends, like to the zoo, the science museum, whale watching and hiking. The beach is one of my favorite places to socialize. The waves and the outdoors help me to regulate. But, and are you doing a ton of typing there with Philip or are you just kind of hanging? That's the, that's the question, right? Nestor says, a lot of the time I go out alone because of multiple reasons. One, socializing does not come naturally to me. Two, there's no one I know around my age that lives close by me enough for me to do something together. And the third is lack of options. There's only restaurants, Targets, Walmarts, and clothing stores close by, so there's not much to do but shop. I like going to museums, but those are far away and I need to drive to them. I'm looking for social groups to join, but that takes a lot of effort to take time out of my day and do something that might not work out in the end. Excellent. Okay, those are those are very real comments, Nestor. Um, 
I don't know if the social groups you're looking at are are in person or if they are virtual virtual, but I'm in favor of virtual if you need to for many reasons. But as William can attest, we do virtual social groups, but then they get together in person at a planned time. So it's so it's not, but yeah, you're always hanging with somebody. You're getting to know people but you don't have to go out all the time to do that. I don't know. It seems to have worked out pretty well. Elena says, side note, there's some good... Oh, okay. There's some good... Uh, no, 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 why that so Thank you. <laughs> uh, Albert, I'm going to stop for one second because Robin just joined us, I think. Are you guys in here? Robin and Sonia? Hi, Robin and Sonia. We just joined. Hi, guys. Hi, Hello. Welcome. 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 Here. We're, we're, here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, we're we're talking about social stuff, and William's finishing up his presentation here, and then we're gonna jump into you. Excellent. And William's, and then we've got all this stuff. I don't know if you can see this the 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 chat prior to joining or not. I don't think you can, but there's lots of good stuff, and I'll read it when it's appropriate for your talk. I've got some questions that I saved for you. Um, but before we get to these guys, let's, let's finish you up, William. Do you have, do you have tips you wanted to give us on how to advocate for your social needs? What were those? My two tips are one, love my calendar and planning my week so I could save enough battery. Two. Take some breaks or ask for them. <laughs> that's a good one. I love that. Looking at the whole picture and planning your battery. That's that's a really good idea. I need to do that. Um, <laughs> then, do you have any tips on accommodating accommodating for social battery of others? Like, how do how would you suggest that other people interpret you or that? Maybe other people might want to try. What did you write? My two tips are, one, ask them what they need. Just because I like or want to do something doesn't mean they want to do the same. That is okay. We can do different things with different people. Two, we handle different situations in our own way be okay with that tim will let me know he needs to leave the room for a little while if it's too loud or i will tell him to pick the restaurant because i will be bringing my own food anyways if we weren't flexible we would spend all of our battery being uncomfortable and miss the rest of the social experience Awesome. Thanks, William. And actually, everyone lets Tim pick the restaurant. Oh, oh. <laughs> Although I did pick a restaurant and he did like it one time. <laughs> Very good. But that is a good rule to live by. Let Tim pick the restaurant. Exactly. Socializing is not always talking or typing. My best mate and I likes to do outdoor activities, and we don't actually talks when we are doing stuff, like going surfing or skiing. Sometimes, we just like to chill out and watch TV show that we like, and that is our form of socializing. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. just hanging out, right, together. Absolutely. Oh, oh, no one likes the hangry Tim. <laughs> no okay Nestor said I'm fine either in person or virtual but it has to be something that works with my schedule and the hard part is starting because everyone says everyone's a stranger before you make connections it is so hard to make new friends um, Carrie says I'm good with two friends but the people forget it <laughs> good point uh, church is good, and in class at church are fine, and the teacher comes back to me when I write my answers. Deva says she likes to socialize or considers it socializing when she's dog walking. 
that's I like to go for walks at walking and talking time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move along here because I think it'll get to to be even a bigger conversation with these two ladies I'm gonna bring in right now. Um, let's bring let's bring in yeah, and thank you, William. You're gonna pop in more, I know. Um, but let's bring in Sonia and Robin from Evolve. Hi, Hi. Robin. Okay, Love gonna, you. Gonna, yeah. Everyone. You guys a little bit. So these two ladies have been um, in my in my circles and acquaintances and professional people I count on for a long time. And uh, and so when we said we were going to talk, we were going to talk about Sonia. I said, oh, I know people, <laughs> I know people who do this, who talk about this. And the, and the reason I'm inviting you guys, you guys, as I know that you are professionals who always consider ad advocate want to self-correct if necessary the point of view of the individuals that you're supporting and so um they're they're not people who are going to tell us how they're not going to write a social goal to talk during lunchtime we already <laughs> talked about that's a big thing. okay so don't even talk if it's in if it's in your shop, um, morning <laughs> no but, they can tell you about their businesses a little bit and they can also, um, but they want them to talk to us about a uh, social battery. So I'm gonna turn it over to you two ladies. Great. Thank you. We're just gonna share our slides. Does that sound good? Is that helpful? Yes. Yay, there we are. Woo, look at us with the slideshow. Right. Can everybody Amazing. see that? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry guys. Move that. And there, the we go. there we go. There we go. We're good. So thank you so much. Really, really, uh, my name's Sonia. I'm Robin. Um, really nice to join you today in this discussion, which I think is really important. So we run a program where young, adult, young adults come to our program. When I say young adults, adults, I think I'm young. Anyway, um, come into our program. It's fully funded by the regional center. And they come to us because they have decided that they would like to access employment and the competitive job market and they would like some support and guidance and mentorship to do that and so we invite the young adults to partner with us during 11 months to figure out well, what are the skills and the jobs that you feel you want to get connected to and want us to help you find and so as it says on the slides you know we've done this for six years and we've really looked a lot at the idea of what does it actually mean to have a job and how do you feel comfortable and confident in that job and how do you understand the employer's expectations and then also the employer understands your needs. So the goal is a partnership. So you've got a job, but you also have this um, compassionate, kind, empathetic relationship between your co-workers and your employers and you as the employee so that everybody can be successful. And so to your point, Darlene, it's like, well, there's a lot of social expectations at work. And so it can feel really daunting. And so what we wanted to talk to you all about today was some of the perspective that the young adults and the adults that we support have provided for us when it comes to what is it that causes them to feel so overwhelmed and exhausted in social or by social situations. So we've worked together for a long time. We've worked in preschools, elementary, middle and high. So we've seen those goals, you know, so-and-so will turn take, so-and-so will do this. And really what, by the time the young adults get to evolve, they've been very honest with us about the impact that kind of programming has had on their social confidence and on their self-esteem and on what they consider to be social pressure. And Robin and I have really worked hard with our young adults to say, okay, let's do a little bit of a fresh start here and we get, get a chance really Robin, do you want to go through these? Yes. Yeah. So um, the, you know, we have it, like Sonia was saying, it's an 11 month program and we have 15 hours a week of working with our young adults, but we always start with 
figuring out exactly what their specific goals are and their needs. And everything we do reflects the work environment. So we are in a live office um, space where our young adults have an opportunity to interact with people who in other offices. But the, we always begin with figuring out what is that balance of the skills that they actually need to develop and what are those areas that they need to learn to advocate to be able to express what it is that they need. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we have a little bit of a laugh with, with our young adults and our adults is we're talking a lot about there is so much information about social skills. Do you know how many books there are in the library and in a bookstore on social skills and social programming? And, and it's all lovely. It's all got these little nuggets. But the number one thing it doesn't often have is the perspective of the individual who is experiencing that social um, anxiety or that social pressure. It's often written by well-meaning neurotypical professionals who have an idea of what it is to be social, right? But that's my perspective or Robin's perspective. Yeah. It's not the perspective of the young adults who come to us. So we have to really sit down and go, okay, tell us what your experience has been. What is it that you feel you're just not into doing? What is it that you sort of feel motivated to do? And um, once Everybody at Evolve has decided that we are not going to teach social skills. Everybody's calms down. And so when you talk about social battery, that's already 50% of the social battery restored. I'm not asking you to turn, take, and smile, and eye contact, and all the rest of it. I'm asking you to figure out what it is that you feel comfortable doing and what are the realities of the workplace? So we always start with person-centered goals. What is it that you personally want to achieve? What is it that we want to teach you about the social expectations of the workforce? And how can we get somewhat of that to meet in the middle? So we have a big giggle at the beginning and say, okay, we're going to practice small talk every morning and everyone groans. And they're just like, oh, that sounds hard hellacious. You may as well pull off my big toenails, you know? And after that conversation has gotten a little more sort of from their perspective, the young adults come in every morning and we do practice small talk, but it's very light. It's very, it flows beautifully. There are no rules. There's no off topics or topics, except for obviously about them sort of sort of appropriate to the employment setting and um and then we really get to do a deep dive into the whole concept of the energy used in social exchanges and i think one of the things that um that we stress that really supports the young adults in being open to this is we talk about it's building social confidence we're not talking about so like again that sonia said we don't use the word social skills ever we talk about social confidence so you can feel that at least you can manage even if it's a very passing conversation that's why we will do this practice we talk about neuroplasticity our brains are changing all the time and it's creating new neural pathways of just understanding that i can build my skills and so, so Yes. Just one second. Um, I don't know if you chose the little glow. We forgot to tell you. Did you choose the little glow on the bottom that says English, number one? On two, there's a little globe. And then you have to say here this in English. That's helpful. Oh, where is that? Oh, is this the... the bottom of your screen? Yeah. Your screen. You're going to see a globe, a world globe. I don't see a world globe. That's the trouble. Go to your more. Go to your, more. Go to your more. And then nope. look at interpretation. You do, you do it that way. Do you see some interpretation? Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, interpretation. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, it was it was not on our screen. English. English. There you go. Perfect. And then um, just a reminder that. 
because it's this is being interpreted and translated, excuse me. Um, crosstalk, which you're not doing terrible at, it's fine, terrible at, it's fine. but crosstalk is hard, uh, well, impossible for the interpreters. <laughs> it's not hard, it's impossible. <laughs> okay. <I'll have> <laughs> no worries, okay. thank you. Okay, we'll be very cognizant of that. Thank you for that. Um, so remember, we're an employment program. So every one of the young adults that we're working with has made a goal of accessing competitive employment. And it's our job to find internships into employment. So we have to look at what are the social expectations within that employment environment or that job so that the young adult can make a really, really informed decision about whether that job is going to be a comfortable um, place given whatever the social dynamics and demands are. And so we really talk about figuring out a realistic environment for you as an individual. So, um, one of the questions that was asked, so we've, we've put some of the questions in this light blue, is, you know, what is the number one experience you hear your clients talk about in terms of their social battery? And every time we discuss social battery, it is, we've sort of watered this down to four. It's stress over the social expectations or perceived expectations, and it's past experiences that have impacted social confidence. And then the anxiety and how much energy is used to manage the anxiety, which then impacts the flow of conversation. And then uh, the adults we work with talk a ton about negative past social experiences and how those have impacted their just their willingness, if you will, to address social with us. And once, sort of three months in, when into our program, when social becomes a little bit more enjoyable, it's not full of a set of rules, it's very respectful of the individual's desire and what they find um, engaging, everybody sort of cools down. And we're lucky, because then we end up with uh, a lot more openness to exploring this thing, this social battery and the energy. And then we talk about tips. So um, <laughs> one of the questions we were asked is, what are some tips that you can give those of us who are trying to manage a social life while having to manage a social battery, which is such a brilliant conversation. Um, everything in Evolve um, starts with self-awareness because you have to really know yourself and know what your limitations are and where it's more about a skill that you just needed to practice versus a true desire and motivation. Um, we talk a ton about self-compassion, that you really need to be kind to yourself and a lot of self-respect to know what is right for you. And, you know, we're an employment company, as Sonia said, and so therefore finding the right fit of a, an employment setting comes from you knowing yourself. Um, we really focus on a lot of positive experiences. That's what Evolve is about. We want to show that there's another way and that you can find ways that work for you within your communication style. Um, we really, really promote and teach advocacy skills because if you think about it, it's really about you being able to tell someone what is it that you need and what you feel most comfortable because that's when you are going to be your best. Um, one of the other things actually are uh, the young adults that we partner with and mentor and work alongside is um, a big, big feedback we've got from the young adults we work with is, look, I don't wanna feel like I have to behave in a certain way or look a certain way or respond in a certain way, but I wanna be aware of the reactions I get from my coworker, 
or my boss or my manager when I may not respond in a way that they expect. And so we've talked a lot about masking becomes less and less stressful and anxiety provoking and energy consuming when you have the language, whether it's you type it, you speak it, you write an email, explaining and helping your boss and your coworkers understand why presenting in a meeting or brainstorming sessions or going out for lunch on a Friday may not be your thing and you're not being antisocial or you don't want to not be with the individuals or join in the social, but you may not feel comfortable or it may be too exhausting to be part of a social exchange that is something that's not enjoyable for you. And so the young adults that we work with, every single one, and it's been over 40, actually it's nearly 50 now, have let us know that the one thing that made a difference was when their advocacy skills went up, their masking went down, and they had much more bandwidth to enjoy and engage and connect in a way that felt authentic to them because they didn't feel so much social pressure. And so that's been really, really one of the things that Robin and I've, I've learned so much about. And so sort of in conclusion. It's really about um, we focus on what is social, what does it really mean? And we work with our young adults to give us the definition because that's the working definition is really what it means to them. Um, and really figuring about what's, what are the must haves because it's a partnership. There are expectations in the social world that we have to work on our first impressions, but really we have to talk about exactly what is a first impression and what is it that you want the other person to see in you. Um, and we work from that to everyone's comfort level. Um, we're, we're big believers in self-assessment and so we are constantly checking in with our young adults and we teach them how to check in on themselves to recognize where their energy is and where they're feeling depleted and what strategies they can use to be able to bolster their social battery as well as the rest of their battery. Um, and then again, it's a balancing act here with social expectations, confidence, and really what is truly, truly expected. And at the end of the 11 month, what we found, and obviously the young adults that we work with can stay with us sometimes two, three, four years, way after they've been employed, they're sustaining their jobs. And one of the things that we found that has been really, really encouraging for us as professionals, that as long as we are willing to step out of our expectation and our vision of what social is and pop ourselves into the young adults that we work with, we end up with this really lovely partnership. And it even becomes funny sometimes. Sometimes our adults will be like, okay, I know I've got to go in tomorrow and do A, B, C, because that's part of the expectation. And we end up in a way that we can be a little bit more light about it and everybody gets to enjoy their social experience. And the one thing about our community, our Evolve community, is our young adults are so pleased to be able to connect and interact with who they have chosen, not who they've been told that they need to be social with, mm. or social success is not a friendship necessarily with a neurotypical individual or someone considered neurotypical, but social is about what you're motivated by and who you end up connecting with. And if a young adult comes to us and says, you know, I don't get as much out of social as maybe another person and I don't want 10 friends. I have one friend online, we chat every two weeks, it makes me happy, then we're happy. Mm -hmm. So it very much is individualized. So thank you. Thank you. We everyone. hope that we shared a little bit of our experience with you. And we're totally open to questions. I don't know if we're doing questions, but you know. yeah, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was great. Um, somebody was asking, uh, do you work with UR funding? Do you get, do you get, can you use so, UR? Um, the, yeah, Evolve is actually a regional center funded program. So it's fully funded. 
And then also the PIP, we use the paid internship program, which is also fully funded. And then when our young adults get a job, which they do, um, then DOR. DOR takes over. And so even though we're not funded by DOR, the young adults that we partner with, they're job coaches or maybe, I don't know, equipment or whatever they need for their jobs is. All right, great. Well, up here at 451, Nestor was asking, um, for, for work I can communicate effectively things that are related to my job. My weak area is when I have to socialize on things like small talk or hobbies because I do not have much to talk about in those situations. I do not know how to talk about fun thing, things neurotypical people my age talk about unless it is about job duties or studying or something. I love your honesty, Nestor. You should really write a blog about this. You you got this. You're giving such great perspective for everybody to hear. I love it. Yeah. Sonia and Robin. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, it's a really great question. Thank you for that because some of the young adults we've worked with have said like in the lunchroom or just the co-workers, there's a lot of chatter that goes along that maybe isn't relevant or exciting or connecting for that individual. And so our young adults have gotten excessively good at advocacy by, the, by this point and have often told us that the way they navigate that is to listen, use active listening, ask questions of other people because everybody loves being asked questions about themselves, right? People like to talk about themselves. And then as the co-workers feel a little bit more comfortable and are not kind of confused by why you're not talking about all your hobbies and all the things that they're talking about slowly they ask our young adults questions and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's about the topics that the co-workers are talking about and it's a slow process but it's a process nonetheless so I had a thought as you were talking about this in your presentation, if the definition of your break time is to take a break and socializing is not break, not break work for you, when do you take your break? Ah, that's, a that's a good question. And that is so much of um, what we say to our young adults is you find those moments that you may be passing somebody in the hall something like that to actually have a social exchange but if you truly again social battery your energy is that you absolutely need a break you take it we do that at evolve then when individuals need a break they truly do because they let us know they're fatigued Eat. yeah elena was asking um which regional centers are you vendor with well, uh, we're vendored with the Harbor Regional Center, our office and our program. We run out of an office space in El Segundo and we have courtesy vendorships with, I don't even know, Lass West Side West and Lanterman. Lanterman. I don't know. Anybody who's asked, we, if we have space, obviously we say yes. And we, the, the Regional Center, obviously Harbor Regional Center, they obviously want their, um, young adults to be obviously supported by us first, but there's been many times where they've been open to other young adults joining in our program. So it's a bit of a mixed match. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Will was asking, do you use artificial intelligence to help folks manage their social battery? We actually don't currently know, but Obviously, we're open to whatever the young adult, or I, I, the, I have to say, actually, the main thing our young adults have said to us is that without the social pressure and the social expectations and social rules, what they've learned to do at Evolve is find, one, what they need to do to ask their boss questions and interact a little bit. And then the second part is what the individual needs to find and be able to express to others about what's enjoyable for them. And so we haven't used AI yet, but that would be something interesting to look into. Definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Tim's got something. Thanks, Tim.
Sonia and Robin, thank you for your presentation. Since Evolve helps people find employment, what advice would you give to us, letting our employers know on what is your social battery? How do you approach that to let your boss know that you need a break and you are a different team member than the rest? Oh, I love that question. Thank you, Tim. For example, I don't like to participate after work gathering with coworkers after an all-day team meetings. It's not because I don't like to be around with people, but after eight hours a day, being in meetings with my co-workers, I really don't want to hang out with them at all after a long day of meetings with the same people that I've seen all day. I understand that. Um, Robin, How do you tell don't... my boss that I need a break from everyone on the team and tell them see you tomorrow, regardless if the whole team is meeting up? I what a great question because Robin and I get so excited by the our young adults um desire to make sure that the people that they're working with, not just the manager, the HR department, everybody is very aware right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And so for us it was about asking our young adults, are you comfortable enough and empowered enough to be able to honestly sit down with your group in a team meeting and have a really good conversation about what it is you feel comfortable with and why you don't and why you do. So we have two young adults that work actually in a research lab. And this is a lab that's quite social. So they'll go out and have a drink and this and what. And the two young adults were very clear with everybody. We really like you. You're great. But here's where we really struggle. And so if we say no, can you understand why? And so, so much of it is about the young adult raising the awareness of the people around them to their perspective of social skills and social situations and really encouraging their co-workers and their managers to open up their minds to another perspective that no going for a drink with you after work as you said Tim actually that's not really what I'm in the mood for it's not something I can handle but I really enjoy my coworkers because we tend to get insulted, right? We say, hey, do you want to go for a drink after work? And the person says no. And we're like, oh, what's wrong with me? So we're very, very, very um, honest with our young adults about feeling comfortable expressing um, to your group and educating the people that you're working with and what it actually means to not to enjoy social in the way you enjoy it, not necessarily the way they may perceive it. Right. I hope that answered your question, Tim. Yeah, I think that's really, really great advice. And I mean, I'm, I would hope that people are getting more um, and empath empathetic to each other to where you don't place your social agenda on other people. Yeah. That, we all have our thing, you know, um, yeah. especially being home for so long and then going back out into public. We all have different kind of ways that we do that now, right? Yeah. And uh, we're not back to where we were before, or before, and some of us don't want to go there, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. And it's interesting, darling, because Every so often we get cheeky and our young adults get cheeky and throw the equity, diversity and inclusion uh, department ethos right back at <laughs> the equity and diversity employee. The whole point of equity, diversity, inclusion is that we sit down and we really hear each other and we hear each other's needs and each other's perspectives and we honor that. And yeah. so every so often we throw that one out too. We throw that one back. Is this a diverse, equitable workforce or not? Right. Now Carrie was asking, <laughs> Carrie is asking, how about older people like Tim and her? <laughs> she she said, Do you work with older people too? Like oh Tim. Oh my gosh, what are you kidding? We've worked with I mean, when we say young adults, I'm sorry, a lot of our our adults oh. just so happen to have transitioned out of high school or college and so obviously but yes I mean had individuals that 
any age. Yeah, in their, their 30s, 30s on up. 40s, and it's pretty 40s. much whoever comes to us and they want to work on these skills, then we say yes. We're not ageist, <laughs> darling. <laughs> oh, okay, good. She said LOL after that, Carrie did. Uh, <laughs> but some of us on the call are not young people. Yeah. Well, others yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, what, uh, can you give us a, maybe a story where you had to coach somebody to really advocate for their social battery in a work setting? Like, can you think of a scenario maybe? That's a constant. That's our, that's our SOS line is what we do all day long. Okay. So I'll give you an example. We just have the holidays, right? And it's full of office parties and social. Perfect. And so we have one um, young man who works remotely and he really did actually want to go. So I'm going to give you two examples. One is I don't want to go. And one is I do. He really wanted to go. He wanted to leave his house and he's got agoraphobia and he wanted to go to this lunch, whatever. And he said, okay, give me three things to say, three topics. What do I do in this situation? Plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. So it was an escape. What do I do if I, I get there and I need to go? So we plan that. What do I say? What's the best way? And so he came up with these questions. Where should I sit? Because noise, sensory. And set up this whole plan. And then went to the, the the lunch was set for two hours he was like i'm going to do an hour no. and because he'd already pre-visualized it pre-sorted it pre-organized it in his head he ended up having a great time mm. one hour and this was somebody who left the house you know i don't know an hour we, just, we didn't persuade him we just hours. wanted to go and then on the other side not wanting to opt in i'm thinking of you know yeah. yeah, well, this is an interesting one. This is where the employer got involved. Ah, so this was, I just want to tell this story because this is true partnership. In Evolve, we really work with our employers to understand exactly what everybody's talking about at this social battery. Our young adults have learned to explain who they are and what their, their needs are. And so this is a company, this is a young man who, um, it's a tech company. And um, the HR director was so wonderful and has been involved at the, every step of the way, really making social expectations minimal and scaffolding it up. It came time for the company party. And what she did was she took this young man and his job coach out to the actual place of where it was going to be. So they did the walk, it was only across the street and they made it across the street for this young man. And they sat down and talked about what it would be like. And this is usually something we would do, but this was the employer. And so uh, the HR director. So she did this whole incredible outing and then came back to us and we worked with him on when to schedule transportation, how long, like Sonia was saying, how long to stay but everything was mapped out. He had that experience and he knew that there was limited expectations from the employer and he went and had an amazing time and his coach ended up not going and it all worked out beautifully. So a theme seems to be planning it out, really rehearsing it, sorting out where, where do you feel like you need that support? Yeah. And you keep saying, planning out how long you wanna be there. Um, and that's a great, 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 I think, um, thing to consider because socially we often don't think, think that way. We think, you know, like, well, when I'm tired of being there, or I want to be the last to leave the party, or I don't want to leave before cake, or, you know, and we have all these <laughs> other social things that tell us what time we're going to leave, right? Or if we're yeah. not going to leave, leave. So I really like the planning out how long you want to stay there because it, it's very different than looking for that social marker that you're taking, right? Yeah. So um, that, that's a great twist. twist. Um, 
Alvar wrote uh, that to me is one of the key reasons that having a cooperative and understanding work environment is so important. Yeah. I have found that explaining my needs is helpful with those who are open to it, and it does address, address my understandings that could arise from declining a social activity. Yeah. Also having folks that can explain once or twice and have to explain every time is, is also nice because it can get tiring to explain again and again when, when it's explanation. It's so true, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So getting that, that getting that getting support to do some of the explaining for you sounds yeah. like uh, you found uh, helpful um, as well. I love that. Um, let's see what else. I'm thinking. I'm looking to see now. There was up at the top. Top somebody thing that I said. We should bring that up. Uh, Sorry, one second. No problem. Just so you know, um, another thing, the young adults have found it incredibly useful to arrange a meeting right from the get-go prior to even starting the job and ensuring that everybody on their team or in their vicinity where they work is aware of um, each other. So they'll go and ask questions. What do you like? what annoys you, whatever. So it looks right from the beginning on a partnership. It's not about you have to adjust to my needs. It's what can we do together to really respect each other's needs. And that's been really a great, it sets a very good tone right from the beginning. That it's not all about the individual with social anxiety or social needs or neurodiversity or autism or whatever you wanna say. It's about everybody in that immediate department or team. Uh, we had one young woman who would talk to one of the, she found somebody who loved cats as much as she did. And they ended up having a really great conversation about cats. And her coworker said, do you talk about anything else? And she was like, no, not really. I really like talking about cats. She goes, hey, anytime you want to come, you want to chat about cats, come my way. So sometimes a lot of this can be done by just loosening everybody up. You know, it's like, this isn't, you know, social cue wars. And I think once it's been opened up and discussed, it's sort of like there isn't that gorilla in the room anymore. It's just open and it becomes kind of a little bit lighter, shall we say, you know? Yeah. Christine had asked, um, and I want to get your guys' input on this. She said her son feels that he must keep all his behaviors under control and pay attention in order to be social. He has managed to do it for about 15 minutes max, but then he ends up in bed after that. What ideas could you give for him for him and be himself and maybe last a little longer in a social situation? Yeah, that's a really good one. I mean, um, so for Robin and I, it's about the, you know how we talk a ton about self-awareness? So what we'll talk to our young adults about, what are the things that you think that you do right, behaviors, whether it's a tick or whatever it is, that you think might, people might comment on and become uncomfortable with? And how much are you willing to say, here's what I can do. I can last five minutes if I'm standing like this. And I'm talking low. But if I do a little techie or I need to pace or I'm rocking a little bit, I actually can engage with you longer, but it's gonna be your choice because I can be social, but it's if I have to be social under your conditions. So much of the time we have to challenge each other to what is it that you're expecting from me? Because if you are, you're gonna get two different me's. You get in the five minute me, or you can have a giggle. I might pace a bit, twitch a bit, whatever, but you can have a giggle with me for maybe an hour. But somebody's got to give something in that otherwise you're just putting yourself in a little box and mm -hmm. acting like a robot i love that idea i love that idea of saying what what do you want from me here what's the yeah. most important piece yeah. being with you or talking with you mm -hmm. yeah um i love that that's a that's a really good tip 
And that's why, by the way, we do so much work on self-awareness and advocacy, because it ends up being about your ability to type, talk, email, whatever it is, whatever your form is, and really be very clear about what your needs are, because otherwise people are guessing or they make assumptions. Yeah. yeah. William had written, I like to know what to plan for. Being in a new place takes time for me to adjust. So I will go early or visit before. So I know that what to expect. I know what to expect when to get, get when I get staff, they will need training on how to support me and not speak for me. It gets better with practice and they will learn about how much or how little support I need in each situation. Oh, that's a great point of view, William, that we didn't talk about. What, how do you guys suggest people tell their support staff, hey, don't take over for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, are actually, with the, as far as we know, uh, the, so the job coaches, let's talk job coach, because that's what we do, employment, and our young adults are with job coaches, because in our actual program, we have 16 young adults, but it's just us and one other person. We don't need a ton of support staff. But um, the job coaches, our young adults do a training session yeah. with the job coach over a period of time where they're very clear they have their emotional regulation written out, their profile, their social needs, and they train. It's not the job coach coming in training our young adults. Our young adults train the job coach, and that shifts the relationship mm -hmm. right from the beginning. You don't come in and tell me what you are going to do to teach me job skills. I'm teaching you what I need, and then you're supporting that. And then Robin and I obviously will say, give them a couple of pointers, but otherwise, we're like, you train the people that are there to support you. We don't, nor does your boss, nor does the job coaching agency. So we're pretty adamant and it shifts the relationship from right from the beginning. That, that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's useful for any time you're training new staff. Is that, is that, because a lot of times you guys know, staff will come in and they'll say, oh, you know what I think? <laughs> Oh, you know what your cousin used? Or, oh, have you had this or you tried this before? Right? Yeah. And they're giving you all these ideas. And so just, and so just that from the get-go to, or starting it off to, I'm going to train you on what yeah. I need. Yeah. I think that, I think that's be huge. You guys might be onto something. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> well, it's worked so far. There you go. <laughs> It shifts the dynamic, you know, so much of it is shifting that dynamic from the job coach going, okay, these are the skills you need, this is what I'm doing, this is what you have to do. We're like, oh, oh no, 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 it doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kerry said he needs to be himself, whatever he does without pressure of being, behaving, being expected to behave, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't need, you, that, that's not what they're getting paid for, you're paying, right? You're paying for your support staff. <laughs> Yeah. My other client does this, but I'm not your other client. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, gosh. Okay. So, so Sonia and um, Robin, thank you so much for joining thank us. Uh, thank it's you. We really enjoyed it. Fun. We, I think we have the PowerPoint. I believe I saw that in my emails. Oh, yeah. And um, so we will put that out there, out there for everyone as well, if you don't mind, just so people have your contact information and your tips and such. William, thank you for jumping in and um, joining us as well. Uh, that's, it, it, we love, and all of you, thank you, everybody who's, everybody who's been listening and changing their lives and all that, thank you all for participating too. Um, that's the thing that we like about this, this hour and a half each month is that it's not, we set up the conversation, but you guys converse. Yeah. Um, Robin and, and Sonia, if you have clients who need us to be a part of their world, 
tell them about us, you know, because we, will. Goes, thank you. we absolutely will. Thank you so much. It's a really great community and um, it's all about you guys. And I think that, isn't it ironic that one of the more engaging activities that we do in our month is the activity where people are using AAC. Yep. <laughs> the irony of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> craziness, <laughs> craziness. It's really engaging, really engaging. So this is cool. Um, we have a few announcements. I'm gonna let Christina get on real quick to talk about, about um, to share our announcements for a second here. And then if you don't cover all of them, we'll all, Tim and I will add, but are you there, Christina? Yes, give me one quick second. I need to pull it up. Okay, do you have, do you have the LCC on there? Um, no. Okay, no, then I'll talk about it now. Cool. Um, <laughs> So next, um, for those of you who were in uh, any of the other trainings that we have, I don't know if you have to be, have to be or if there's rules or not. If Guild is around, she can tell us if we have rules. But um, we we like to encourage people to join. The, the DBU offers on next Thursday, the fourth Thursday of the month, a group, uh, LCC, which is... is Oh God, I can't, I, it's 5.30. I can't think of the name of why we call it LCC. Something about, and Tim's got it. He's always got it. He'll tell you in a second. Anyways, Tim and I are going to do know this. Oh, Leadership Community Connect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, so uh, the group is this month is going to, we're going to be talking, be talking, uh, putting together your presentations not just your elevator pitch. We're going to take it beyond the elevator pitch. Like how do you actually do your presentations in whatever setting you're looking to advocate for yourself? Um, so we'll talk about, so we'll talk about pictures, slideshows, whatever you want to call it. We'll talk about how to set those up, how to use them, how to present yourself and a little bit of knowing your audience and all that kind of good stuff. So if you can join us then on Thursday, the 25th, um, and Christina, jump in whenever you're ready. We also have our self-advocate speakers bureau coming up the second go around. So if you want to repeat, feel free. It'll be a little bit different, but it's geared for starting getting again. And um, if you haven't joined us before and you want to work on your self-advocacy skills um, and maybe even move on to be a part of the Self-Advocate Speakers Bureau that we have, which allow, allow us and community at large to recruit people to be different speakers. So I think Christina has some testimonials for us, right? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I thought I muted myself, but it said I was not. So I just want to double check. Um, oh no. So yes, I'm we have um a couple testimonials from our previous um cohort of our self-advocate speakers bureau. I just put in the chat right now um the application and our website if you're looking for more information. I just want to let everybody know that our application closes at the end of this month. Um, but oh, our pictures aren't loading. Uh oh, well, 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 you saw what William looked like today. Uh, his as testimonials you see on the on the slides. Um, SASB, so Self Advocate Speakers Bureau, gave me the tools and confidence to put my advocacy into action. Preparing and using my elevator pitch in Sacramento to advocate for my for communication access with represent, representatives from the governor's office and DD, DDS. Oh, excuse me. I switched those words. Taught me that we can silently exist or we can live out loud with our voices united. Um, we have Kathleen Barajas here. The SASB has sparked new ideas for me as a public speaker for disability rights and education. 
Jonathan Davis. Um, his name is Jonathan Davis. He's had multiple opportunities to speak at multiple workshops centered around support for individuals with disabilities since the DVU program, which provided him the tools to speak effectively and confidently. Brandon Nash stated that training with SASB gave me a new direction to work toward and did help me clarify and articulate a new perspective on my career and achievements. Emma Cladis said the Speakers Bureau training even gave me the confidence to try using my voice to communicate at the Emerging Speakers TACA seminar. As a person who usually types to communicate, this was so helpful and I will do it again. Jeremy Cecile Kira from participating in the SASB training, truly I learned how important it is to use your own personal experience to make a learnable point for the audience. Tabby Bradley, I learned that by using concise, passionate language to convey my ideas, my voice will be heard and my advocacy efforts for systemic change will be taken more seriously. Allison Cameron Gray, through the Self-Advocate Speakers Bureau, I learned how to give compelling public testimony. Richard Gallo, SASB is about changing the narrative about disability. Ms. Sarah Wright, I gained presentation skills and confidence in myself as a self-advocate. And lastly, Keith Bonchek. The SASB training was an excellent help in polishing my elevator speech so I could quickly get my message across in a personal and professional manner. Thank you, Christina, for putting that together. So if you or you or your people who are looking to build their skills and their confidence in being a self that that it's called the self advocate speakers bureau but we like to just call you advocates um <laughs> because you're not always advocating for yourself you're for yourself you're for yourself and others but you know what i mean so if you you know a lot of times you might not have had practice doing this doing this you might have had instruction on doing this you might not have been in a place where you got feedback or even the structure of how to put a presentation together. That's the kind of thing we cover. And then we also practice. It's all virtual. It's uh, uh, three sessions. I hope this isn't what you're typing, Tim. Is it what you're typing? Oh, oh are you done? Oh. <laughs> Can I say your <laughs> So I'll step on his toes. So you have... Um, well, we have three sessions. They start in February. You can see the uh, website link there and the application link there. February 14th is the orientation. February 21st is the first day. It goes for an hour and a half. I believe we're starting at three this, this year, this cohort. Um, and it'll run every other week, the 21st. And then I think it's like March 5th or something like that, like that. And then every other week. Um, so you're all welcome. Tell your friends, uh, anybody it's, it's only, only for self advocates. It's not for professionals, um, or families. It's for the self advocates to join. Um, um, and, uh, we would love to see you there. Of course we have self-determination, um, workshops, you know, you know, every, whatever that is the third Wednesday or the second and fourth, or I don't know the numbers, but you guys know it if you know it. <laughs> um she is my mind reader can she read my mind now because i'm getting hungry no one has to read your mind to know that <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my gosh um anyways i want to thank everybody for joining us sonia and robin if you're still around again thank you so much william thank you william thank you mm -hmm. um Oh, and I want to thank our interpreters, Amy and Ernest, today. And I also really quick because I have one minute left. Who we have? A, we have some new um, staff members for DVU on here. On here, mm -hmm. would you guys mind if we show you really quick? Okay, good. I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Where are you? Come on down. Elena, come on down. How do I make them come down? Mm. There we go. Here's Elena. Elena, say hi. 
There we go. Unmute you guys. Come on. Okay. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Here we go. No? Yes? Hi. So uh, we have one other person that isn't on the call right now, but these two lovely ladies are joining us as um, uh, I'm blocking on the words because it's 530 in a long day. Okay. Assistance, program assistance, what is it called? <laughs> and so they will be in the background to some of our meetings sometimes. So thank you both for joining us and uh, getting the feel for who we are and what we do. All right, everybody. We'll see you, see you next month. Thank you. Bye.